for the board discussion items and the first board discussion item is BD1 by Dr. Robinson. Thank you. So this discussion item somehow got misinterpreted by the public, but this is about um, returning to this building. So two weeks ago, as part of my comments, I said that we cannot let our guard down regarding these pandemic safety precautions. In the words of the CDC, we must, quote, have consistent implementation of layered prevention strategies to reduce SARS-CoV-2 transmission in schools, which includes social distancing, improved ventilation, improved air quality, frequent hand, hand washing, and wearing of masks. I made note of the CDC, CDC statement revising physical distancing recommendations to reflect at least three feet between students and classrooms and provide clearer guidance uh, when a greater distance uh, is recommended. And so what the, I'm going to roll into the Fulton Holland in a second. In the elementary schools, students should be at least three feet apart. In middle schools, um, and, and this is with a mask, as they called it, the layered um, prevention strategies. In middle schools and high schools, students should be um, at least three feet apart in, when there's low or moderate uh, community transmission. In areas of high community transmission, middle and high school students should be at least six feet apart if cohorting is not possible. Um, and so I brought that up last time. I want you to know Palm Beach County continues to be um, high, have high community transmission and asymptomatic spread is real. So um, the CDC says specifically to maintain six feet of distance in the following settings, between adults and between adults and students at all times in the school building. Several studies have found that transmission between staff is more common than transmission between students and staff and, and transmission between students in schools. Um, when masks cannot be worn, such as eating, six foot feet is recommended during activities with the increased exhalation, such as singing, shouting, band, sports, and exercise. Um, and they suggested moving these activities to outdoors and in common areas, such as school lobbies and auditoriums. Now, having said all that about adults and adult to adult concerns, um, I was very concerned when I saw the April 12th letter from the superintendent stating that all employees in this Fulton Holland Educational Services Center should return to on-site work on May 17th. These are adults. So we know adult to adult transmission is what is continuing to drive this pandemic. Um, in many parts of this building, people are almost on top of each other. They're in cubbies. They're way closer than I am to Mrs. Andrews. And the ventilation seems to me to be relatively poor. And the circula circulating variants, you, I'm sure you know, are more contagious than the original wild virus. So let me just say, as Mrs. Andrews said in earlier comments, I appreciate the fact that many of our employees never left their on-site work. I get that. I appreciate the fact that our school-based staff returned to brick and mortar months ago, actually against my will, but that's what happened, right? And I realized that almost everybody has been working, some people even more productively than when they were in the building, right? So most everybody's been doing their job, whether they're inside brick and mortar, driving a bus, or working from home supporting others. So. I push for and will continue to push for us to make workplaces as safe as possible, including the schools. And again, I want to keep stressing an intentional focus on improvements in ventilation. So I've had conversations with several people about this issue. I understand that there are some employees that have really disappoint, disappointed their supervisors in multiple different ways during this distance work experience. That does not mean to me that we knowingly put people at risk and put them in an unhealthy situation. If people are not performing their job to the level of expectation or with the appropriate level of professionalism, they should be warned. They should have a verbal warning to make sure that the job expectations are high and clearly communicated. And they should understand that in this new educational environment, because things are changing, 
now more than ever, you might want to make sure that you're doing your job and show everyone how important your, your work is to contributing to this educational system because teamwork makes a dream work, right? So my point is this. Let us solve the problems that exist with the solution that addresses that problem. If the problem is that some people are not working or the problem is some people complain because they think others are not working, then what we need to do is evaluate whether or not people are not doing their job and address that, right? I think we need to double down on the layered safety precautions at schools and other sites, including here. So I just really think it's a bad move to, to just say everyone must come back into this building. When I see how people are almost sitting on top of each other, go into ESC, go into early childhood, go into teaching and learning, they're like on top of each other. That cannot be safe. Um, and so I, I just couldn't let it, I couldn't let it rest. So thank you. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Robinson, for bringing this up. <clears throat> I'm not going to call this individual person's name, but this person works in this building. And, and they felt like when they received the letter saying that they had to return to work uh, beginning on Monday the 17th, uh, they felt like it was uh, a microaggression toward all the people who supported the, the schools and the teachers this past year felt really unappreciated. I, I spent the time reading this, and this is why I was thanking everybody today, because this one person says that, you know, they felt unappreciated. Nobody has actually uh, confer, uh, conferred with them about how they feel. And, and one of the things the person said is, why is there no staggering? or grouping before we ask for everybody to be back here on the 17th. And they said, just as you said, Dr. Robinson, please go to the second floor, walk through C223 and C225. I'm sure all the chairs are not six feet apart. And you know, the people are feeling like uh, you're asking them to come back and they don't know if it's safe here in the building. So uh, I'm encouraging uh, the superintendent, uh, the team here t before the 17th to start sending uh, communications out to the staff that work here in the building that's been working hard. I mean, they talked about all the things that they do, even supporting schools at night, uh, more, working more hours than they had done during the regular time, but working remotely. And, and, and they want to feel that we're thinking about them, so not just get back here to work on the 17th, but maybe if they have any comments or concerns about their own quarters uh, as to how things are going to be when they're asked to come back, let's, he let's get their voices heard. And certainly uh, some of the folks that's uh, up there in the curriculum department, I've walked through those places. I mean, we know how tight it is and I don't know how we're gonna get them all back in there. So you may have to do some staggering. We may have, we may not be able to do it. I'm not quite sure if they can all get in here. And they're talking about we're talking about an eight hour day all day long wearing a mask and you're up on top of everybody else. So this was appropriate. And I'm just encouraging the superintendent and team to think about the people in this building. They're so valuable in making sure the rest of the district runs smoothly. And now some of them are feeling like, you know, they're ordered to come back and no one has asked them anything. Any other discussion? All right, thank you. Next item on the agenda is BD2, Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, this, is, this is my learning loss, math learning loss. I think I need the projector to work. Am I supposed to be doing something? Thank you. <laughs> because you know I don't know what I'm doing with this thing. Okay, so thank you. So um, you know I've been working on trying to communicate what I see in data. Um, and so I wanted to, well, first let me thank Mark Howard and Dr. Adam Miller for um, helping me pull this data and, and, and slice and dice it and figure out what the data is telling us and answer my 3,000 questions about numerators and denominators. So I wanted to answer two questions when I started walking this path. First is who is enrolling in algebra and when? And then secondly, 
did students lose any math skills during the pandemic? And so the first um, few slides are telling us who, who is taking algebra and when. So now these slides are orange and blue. You know I'm not an orange and blue person, and so I know it's hard to look at, right? So I'm sorry. So you will know here, this is middle school. This is middle school enrollment um, by grade in Algebra 1. And so let me just take a minute and try to walk through it. So um, these are, uh, I've got too many things going on here. So you will note that in addition to white, black, and Hispanic, we've added Asian as a subgroup. Um, we show children in poverty marked as free and reduced lunch and middle class, which is marked as non-FRL. I did not request the gender along with the racial, ethnicity, and SES disaggregation here. So now I'm only showing data. I hope that we will all be curious and ask the how and the why questions so we can remedy the disparities. So we're looking at who's enrolled in Algebra 1 in middle school. So this data includes Palm Beach virtual as well as distance and brick and mortar enrollment. Um, on the left is seventh grade, on the right is eighth grade. In each grade level from left to right is Asian free and reduced lunch, Asian middle class, black free and reduced lunch, black middle class, Hispanic free and reduced lunch, Hispanic middle class, white free and reduced lunch, and white middle class. And this pres pattern of presentation continues throughout these slides. So these are percentages. Blue is a 1920 school year and orange is the 2021 school year that we're in. So these are the, the years that ended with the pandemic and started with the pandemic. The numerator is the number of children in each subgroup who were enrolled in Algebra 1 at any time during the school year for that designated grade level. The denominator is the number of children in that grade and in that subgroup. So for seventh grade, the highest percentage enrollment is Asian middle class students at 33% um, in fiscal year 20 and 38% in fiscal year 21, followed by Asian students in poverty at 21 and 26%. So who is not in Algebra 1 in seventh grade? Black students, whether living in poverty or middle class, Hispanic students, whether living in poverty or middle class, and white children, especially those in poverty. So those groups enrollment range from five to 14%. And white middle class enrollment in Algebra one in seventh grade is 19% and 21% in those two years. So now I just want to um, share just a bit of history as I'm looking at this. Um, and I will, I probably will say repeatedly, it's my opinion that we should set an expectation that Algebra one is taken in eighth grade. Years ago, we had a pilot at two schools for all students at the schools to take Algebra one in eighth grade. One of those schools was Palm Beach, I mean, Palm Springs Middle School. The pilot failed. I was told it was due to lack of back mapping the pre-algebra skills into the earlier grades. I guess I'm one of the few adults that believes that our routine course of study should be Algebra one in eighth grade. Since it is a gatekeeper course in all, for all math and sciences, including the math and sciences that create vaccines, save the environment, take a spacecraft to Mars, et cetera. I think this is another manifestation of an adult problem. So let's look at eighth grade, okay? The pattern is, is more or less the same. But tell me, how do you get into algebra one in eighth grade currently? You take seventh grade advanced math. How do you do that? You take sixth grade advanced math. How do you do that? Some administrator determines that you are ready or worthy, okay? So we are sorting children to determine whether or not they're gonna be our future scientists and engineers and so forth coming out of fifth grade. All right, I'm gonna move on. Uh, I think I'm gonna move on. Okay, so this should be high school. This is high school algebra enrollment, okay? Um, ninth is on the left, 10th is on the right. You can see really that our expectation for algebra one, our normal for algebra one is ninth grade. You will see that enrollment for Asian students and white middle class students peaked in eighth grade. So ninth grade is where black, Hispanic, and white children in poverty peak for their algebra enrollment. Now, you also see 10th grade on the right. Now, 10th grade is late to take Algebra one if you're college bound. 
There are low numbers here for Asian students as well as middle class white students. And the percentages for black, Hispanic, and poor white children are in the, between the teens and the 30 percentile range. So unfortunately, um, from fiscal year 20 to 21, you see increases in the percentage of children taking what I'm going to call late algebra in 10th grade uh, for the Hispanic middle class, white children in poverty, and blacks in the middle class. I'm not answering the why questions because I, don't, I didn't try to dig into them. I can speculate that part of it was COVID, right? Because these are children who were enrolled. It's not children who were taking it for the first time. So some of those children might be repeating algebra. Now, here's the, here's the one that makes me cry. So these are just numbers. These are not percentages. Who is taking Algebra 1 in 11th and 12th grade currently? OK, again, I don't know if this is first time or repeaters. These are raw numbers. So you, you see um, black is on the left, white is in the middle, Hispanic is on the right. These are raw numbers, but when you know that our district um, in high school enrollment is pretty close to a third white, a third black, a third Hispanic, the disproportionality is obvious. So as we talk about equity and excellence, let's figure out how to make this important gatekeeper course to norm, norm in eighth grade for everyone. Now I want to talk about loss, learning loss. So, <laughs> okay, this one looks at all students by subgroups that were enrolled in Algebra 1 in the fall of 2020 and took a math diagnostic in the previous year, in January 2020, and the same test, it was the very same test in September of 2020. Now, most of the children taking Algebra 1 as shown previously are in 8th and ninth grade, but this is all children. Um, so the, the bar graph shows the percentage of each subgroup by race, ethnicity, and social economic status that scored level 3 and above on the diagnostics. Okay, so blue is 20, January 2020, orange is September 2020. And again, it's the same racial ethnic groups from left to right as before. So every group scored lower in the fall on the second diagnostic, except Asian middle class students. So somehow they managed to continue learning. Others did not. Everyone else had learning loss and white students in poverty had the greatest learning loss. Now, this one is middle school students. It's the same data, but pulling out middle school students. So as I described already, these are the students that someone thought worthy and ready to, to take accelerated math and put them on the course for algebra by eighth grade. So um, the denominator here is all middle school students enrolled in Algebra 1 in the fall of 2020. It's mostly eighth graders, as you saw before. The numerator, again, is those scoring level three and above. Blue is January 2020, orange is September 2020. So most groups had some learning loss. The most loss was with black students, both in poverty and the middle class. Noticeably, Asian students in the middle class and white middle class students were able to maintain. They had some very small gains. So learning loss was not as apparent in those groups here. And on to high school, and I think this is my last slide. So this is high schoolers in Algebra 1 in fall 2020. It's mostly ninth graders as previously represented. This represents, again, the percentage of students of the subgroup that scored level 3 and above on the diagnostic exam in January 2020, which is blue, and September 2020, which is orange. The denominator is all students in high school in the same demographic group. There's evidence of significant, significant continued learning for middle class Asian students. But what was really, to me, mind-blowing is it was significant learning loss for Asian students in poverty and white students in poverty, right? And so we, this is just another manifestation of disparities um, in our district. And this is with this terribly important gatekeeper course. So we know we have access issues, and we also documented for many students learning loss, right? Um, so I think our standards are too low. I think Algebra 1 should be expected in eighth grade. 
I thought we had previously, over the years, back mapped the curriculum so that they developed those pre-algebraic skills long before eighth grade. Apparently, we have not, or if we did, somebody doesn't believe. I'm just showing this because we're talking equity and excellence. Here's a problem we need to solve. So thank you for your attention. If, any questions, I'll be happy to see if I can answer them. Thank you. Any questions, comments, board members? Okay then, BD3, Ms. Brill. Thank you, so Mrs. Bass is passing out um, a couple of policies for you. So um, the discussion item actually should, should have read that I wanted to discuss establishing comprehensive policies and procedures for human resources as well as a new procedural manual aligned to the policies. Um, all of us have been on the, have been on the board for a while know that we've had a lot of um, lawsuits over the years um, because we really don't have tight policies. Um, and in speaking with our inspector general, um, she was she's highlighted that for me over the course of her her time with us. Um, my background, once upon a time, I was in HR, so it's always been kind of a bone of contention when I first came on board about you know the way we post, the way we hire. So I have a lot of questions. The two policies that you see, one of them is two lines. It's on promotional practices. And the policy was last updated 20 years ago. And then the other policy, which is on criminal background checks, was updated in 1997 and references a statute that was repealed in 2003. So we clearly um, need to tighten that up. And it's not going to be an easy process. I mean, it's going to take some time. Um, I would hope that we would ask the IG to work with legal and HR to craft some comprehensive policies. One thing I do want to bring up, which um, Mr. Katz brought up to me from CTA today, which I told him we could address as we get the policies, is to make sure that whatever policies are created don't conflict with our collective bar bargaining agreements. So as I told him right now, this is just in the discussion stage. Uh, but I do think it warrants us looking at all practices in HR. It'll make us do better. And then having a comprehensive um, employment manual or HR manual that aligns with our policies will just help us do better and hopefully eliminate a lot of the complaints that we get. So I welcome your comments. Mr. Chairman, if, you, if I may, so just uh, thank you, Ms. Brill, for bringing this up. I just wanted to let the board know that we have solicited prior to this um, discussion item the Council of Great School, City Schools to review our processes and to give us some feedback and the Sterling Group uh, the, um, the Sterling Council is also reviewing our practices, so we should get those reports in, soon. Uh, the standard operating manual, I instructed them to start creating that last August. But it, so we have a template in place, but if the board chooses to get us to create new policies, then we can just easily update that. But thank you, Ms. Brill, for bringing that forward, and we will share those information with the if board I and do quick follow up. Ms. Brewer, you have a follow-up. Well, well, just as a follow-up to Dr. Fenoy, um, I respect that, but I want to make sure that we focus in, we hone in on human resources. So if they're looking at all of our policies and procedures overall, that's fine. But no, I specific to HR. Okay. Yeah, specific to HR. Mrs. Andrews, then Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you, Ms. Brill, and I think this is really timely. Uh, I was in HR back at the time we did policy 3.45. And uh, I just think just, just tonight on the board agenda, we had a policy uh, 3.45 appointment. And how that was handled was, to me as a board member, was pretty inappropriate by getting an email uh, about this selection of, of this person and then looking in the paper and it was already done. And this is our policy. And so I think this policy really needs to be looked at. We put this in place back during that time because there was a shortage of people. Uh, we wanted to make sure the superintendent had an opportunity to get the best people. A lot of thought went into that. And it was a way that, you know, we didn't have to wait around for the process. So I do remember how that actually uh, started. But now I think when uh, it's being used, and it's our policy, and we don't even have any uh, conversation about what's going on with this kind of uh, appointment. 
uh, it, 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 it's a problem. It was a problem for me this week, you know, not the person, but how the policy was used as a board member, not understanding exactly what was going on in this, in this movement that was really quickly. So I think that's necessary. I like the idea of getting the, the uh, working with the Council of Great City Schools and others to get this manual going. But even with this 3.45, I would like the superintendent as, as well as uh, HR to know that this is our policy and if some, and the superintendent has the power to put people in, uh, but it would be uh, respectful that a board member would know that before looking in the paper uh, and, or seeing it in an email that it's being done. Uh, and I just remember because I was a part of it at that time uh, as an employee that it was because we really wanted to make sure that we had the people in place to do the job that needed to be done. And if we identified them, we could move forward. But certainly now as a board member, this is our policy and we need to do better. And as I looked at the one for the uh, criminal background checks, we have so much confusion with the criminal background checks. All the people call me over and over. And I've been working with Vicki Evans because of how this process uh, runs and people feel that they're being discriminated. They don't get a chance to get a job within the district of Palm Beach County because of this uh, process. And we were told that something was gonna happen with it, but we need to really look at this because uh, uh, I've heard and a lot from people who uh, feel powerless in this big bureaucracy of the Palm Beach County School District, that they get shut out of this process because of information that may or may not be real about them, but how we handle it here at the district. So both of these are very critical to me, and I was happy to see you put this on as a discussion item because the criminal background check is a big issue for me as I re relate to a lot of people who feel left out because of how we process. And the 3.45 just this past week, I felt like it was our policy, but I didn't even know too much about what was going on in the usage of, the, of it this week for the selection of uh, uh, an employee for a promotion. Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you. I just wanted to thank Ms. Brill for bringing this up. I, um, I agree that we have some very old policies on the books and um, I had a similar conversation with Ms. Michael and I, I, you know, I think it's definitely something we should look at and I think we should um, be putting together really, um, you know, if the Council of Great City Schools can help us to come up with policies that are appropriate for, you know, this millennia, which is what we're in now, um, I think it would be very good. So I, I definitely support the idea of, of looking at this further um, and checking to make sure that our policies are really in align with what we would like them to be. Thank you. General Counsel, uh, I'm not suggesting we need to re revise every policy, but can you please have your staff look through the policies? If, if they're referencing statutes that are no longer effective, then they need to be brought to the board's attention before we look like fools trying to enact a, enforce a policy that references a statute that's not in place any longer. So would you please have your staff take a look at the policies and find those legal inconsistencies and bring it to our attention so we can make decisions on what we want to do with those? Absolutely. Ms. Brill. Thank you. So, Mr. Barbieri, it, it goes beyond that. Our policies are weak. Our policies are not proper in terms of human resources. Um, we need to look at um, some things such as employee transfers, hiring, advertising of positions. It's not just the two policies. I just brought you those two as an example. But, you know, many, many of the cases that we deal with, of the complaints that we get, oh, you know, the friends and family system that we have in place. It all goes back, and it's not the fault of our HR department. They inherited the policies that are there. So what I'm asking for is for collaboration. Yes, I like the idea of the Great Council of Great City Schools and anyone else that can look at it, but we've been talking about this for a long time. I remember when I first became a school board member, there was some other entity that was gonna look at all our policies. So, you know, maybe we can also look at some of the other school districts. I know it's going to be time consuming. I know it's going to take time. All I'm asking for is let's start to clean this process up. Let's not wait for someone to come to us with it. Statute says that our job is budget and policy. So if we don't do this, then we're really not doing our job. General Consul, isn't there a state statute that requires the board to update policies on some periodic basis, but n number of years? I believe Mrs. Rico told us that once, that policies have to be revisited by the board 
every five years, every 10, I don't know what, the, what it was, but can you check that out? Yeah, I'll, and I'm not suggesting, Ms. Brill, that we, we don't look at the policies that need to be updated. I'm just suggesting the easiest thing at, quickly to get done is have your staff look through these policies and find statutory references that don't lo no longer exist. Yes, okay. we'll, we'll absolutely take up the charge on looking through um, whether or not there's any <laughs> outdated statutes and things of that nature in the policies. All right, and let us know what the, what the law says with respect to how often these policies have to be up updated because the, if we're violating the law, certainly we have to start, you know, taking a look at getting the policies, a lot of them maybe redone as soon as possible. Okay. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, I think this is a fantastic idea. Um, I want to separate policy and procedure because I don't want, um, I think we need to look at procedures too. And I don't want, I've watched, I've watched the pendulum swing over these years about what belongs in policy and what does, belongs in procedure. I think we're kind of in the middle, in the balance act, but I think that there's things in procedure that need to be reviewed. Right? I'm, I'm not trying to put everything that should be in procedure in policy, but I think that there's a lot that needs to be reviewed. I think one, I would ask general counsel to look at the lawsuits over the past five years and see if there's been some correction in how we operate, whether it's in policy or procedure, um, that would prevent that from happening again. But I'll tell you the thing, is two things that come to my mind. Dr. LaCava knows which the first one is, and that's the whole thing with the background checks and offering people job letters to, to and they quit their, their previous job and then the background check comes with some weird thing in it. Um, I think we need to correct that for the sake of humanity, right? But then the other thing is just communication. So as I understand, for example, I'm going to say advertising for a principalship. Let's say it's a middle school principalship, and the advertisement is just like this generic thing, right? And they get 100 applications. They can't interview 100 people. So then they add criteria to screen by, right? And they might say, okay, well, we want somebody who's been in this particular programmatic area or whatever, whatever. But what happens is then people get screened out and they meet the criteria advertised and they don't understand why they got screened out. And so somehow we have to communicate that because it appears very um, arbitrary to people who are applying, even if it makes perfect sense and even if all the documentation is there. So our communication in the process needs to improve, but I'm glad you brought it up because we, we, um, we do need to clean up our act. So thank you. Anyone else? All right, thank you, Ms. Brill. The next item is BD4, Mrs. Andrews. Thank you, and I've already spoken to Dr. Fenoy about this. And uh, as we heard tonight, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're getting better, but we still have a long way to go. And um, we've had uh, Dr. Alonzo here with us in the past. And I just know as we get ready uh, to uh, bring everybody back to get the students where they need to be, we need to have periodic updates, monthly updates. I, I see Dr. Alonzo doing the updates at the County Commission. I see the wonderful dashboard that they have that I read and I understand where we are and we have a long way to go. And you've heard people on both sides with the mask mandate. Some of them want the uh, option to be able to uh, have their children not wear a mask and some want to have uh, the ability to make sure that masks are worn. And we are following the CDC guidelines. And I think we need to have a discussion. Uh, each month we have this school board meeting. There should be a, a part of our agenda talking about this, you know, and having the experts here so that when people are talking to us, I don't want them to think that we're not knowledgeable, that we're not listening to the advice of the leaders uh, across the county and across the state and nation, especially the CDC. And, uh, and so I think we, we really do need to have these monthly uh, uh, sessions when we have our public board meeting. Now, I know that we say we were sending information out and people see it, but we need to talk about it. Just like tonight with all these people here, it would have been wonderful if we had had Dr. Alonzo here, you know, to talk about how she sees it. We know how the county sees it because we look at their board meetings, but we're the largest employer. We're dealing with all of the children. We're trying to get them back to school and all of our employees back to work. And over these next few months, for sure, 
as we move through this crisis, and hopefully we're getting out of it if we get people to get their vaccines, we, uh, we need to have this uh, discussion, a little piece of our agenda at our major board meetings on this. Any other comments? Dr. Robinson? Thank you. Um, I mean, I think that's a fine idea. I actually think um, my recommendation would be that Dr. Fenoy also re-engages his, whatever that group was called, a COVID advisory committee or whatever it was called, because there's still some things. I mean, one day, one day, hopefully, we'll get to the point where, like, everything goes back to some sense of normal. But no, I haven't read anything yet that tells me, um, as, as a medical professional, when it's okay to do certain things. Like, and then what do we drop first? Do we drop the mask first or the six foot social distancing first, right? And so I know that some people don't understand like the evolution of knowledge and science, but many people do and they need to help um, this district analyze that so that we can make the best recommendations. I mean, I actually think it's really way premature to talk about whether or not what we do with masks in the fall. Like, like it's, why are we talking about that now? But I mean, I know why politically, but I'm just saying scientifically, it makes no sense. So I just think that we need to, while Dr. and Dr. Alonzo is an employee of the state, right? And so we just need to make sure, I think that we bring the uplift those other voices that, um, you know, are accustomed to, to following the, the medical uh, science as it evolves so that they can give us their best recommendations. Ms. Ayala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, speaking of everything a little bit, since we've had a lot of topical health related discussion tonight, um, I wanted to ask the superintendent or staff to consider the idea of clear panel masks for those who are hard of hearing or deaf. They have been CDC approved. There are various types that we can circumvent that one complaint because we all, I'll speak for myself. I believe that masks will be necessary to continue curbing COVID-19 for the time being. It is way too early to make decisions right now on one way or the other what we're going to do in three months. Things, things are changing incredibly rapidly, but I don't want that to be a reason why folks feel they can't wear the mask. So if we could invest or seek partnerships to get those kinds of masks with a clear panel, I think we'd be doing a lot. Um, I would like to explore that if possible. Mr. Superintendent. Yeah, so I think I, that's something new news to me, but what I can definitely do, Mr. Burke and the team and I have been talking about the massive purchases we have to make for next year anyway, so we'll definitely research that as part of our purchases for next year in terms of PPE. Mrs. Andrews? I would just like Dr. Fanoa to respond about uh, the piece where uh, getting the committee back together and also having Dr. Alonzo come in here and work with us. Oh, I have no, that's the will of the pleasure of the board. I, I have no problem at all. Okay. All right, board members, would you like us to make, make an invitation to Dr. Alonzo to at least she can log on with us virtually if she doesn't want to come into every, every month at their regular board meeting so she can give us an update on the latest thinking of the health, at least the health department. Yeah. And Dr. Robinson, you suggested other groups other than, I'm not sure who those are, but if you want to get those of the superintendent. Uh, Dr. Fenoy knows he had the COVID advisory committee at the beginning of this madness. Yeah, it's, it's the same committee and I, I, I talked to him a couple of months ago and Dr. Alonzo was part of that team. So all, all we have to do, Mr. Tierney can just set up the call and we'll get it done. All right, any other discussion? Mrs. Andrews? It's not about this. I just wanted to point a personal privilege. Go ahead, Mrs. Andrews. I just uh, would like to uh, read the statement uh, about, the, uh, about George Floyd that came from the Council of Great City Schools. I know we've been in here a long time, but I cannot let this evening pass without me reading the statement uh, from Michael Cassily, the executive director of the Council of Great City School as it related to the verdict of the uh, Chauvin trial. So uh, if this is okay, I would like to do it right now. Thank you. And I'd like to say to the public that the Council of Great City Schools is 77 of the largest urban school districts in the nation. And Palm Beach County School District has been a member for many, many years. And so this is the statement that is being uh, presented tonight 
from the council. It says, statement by Michael Casserly, Executive Director, Council of Great City Schools, on the verdict in the Chauvin trial. Yesterday in Minneapolis, a jury reached a guilty verdict in a murder trial that has potential to serve as an inflection point in our nation's history. When George Floyd was killed last summer by police officer Derek Chauvin, the nation's urban public schools offered our full-throated condemnation of the killing and the racism behind it. While this verdict cannot bring back Mr. Floyd and the many lives unjustly lost in Americans' communities of color due to police brutality, it does rekindle our hope that this country can grow and that justice for all can be realized. Today, the nation's urban public schools commit to ensuring that equity and racial justice for all of American citizens serve as our North Star. We vow to do our part in helping our students, staff, and graduates step into their communities holding the highest regard for the value of lives of their neighbors. We take solace in the justice that was served yesterday and recognize that tomorrow we must continue to push against the walls of racism and inequality to ensure that our students enter a society that values them and their contributions to the world, where there is equal protection under the law. The Council will continue to fight to ensure racial justice and use our collective efforts to make sure our schools are nurturing, welcoming environments for students, particularly of color, as we work toward creating an equitable nation free of ignorance, fear, and prejudice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. Are there any further items the board wants to comment on? Mr. Superintendent, do you have anything else? Yes, sir. Take a motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion by Ms. Ayala, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. This meeting is adjourned. Drive carefully. Thank you.